What's up everyone? Welcome back to the shop. Today we're going to talk about 10 things that I really wish I would have known when I first started woodworking. In no particular order, number one, sanding through all of the grits. I used to think I had to sand 100 grit, 120, 150, 180, 220, and so on. Nope, don't do it. Instead, I sand with two grits, 120 and 180. Sometimes I'll bust out 220 if the project really needs it, but typically 120, 180. I usually use either Cubitron or Festool paper. Both of them are good. The 3M stuff's a little bit cheaper. I like them both. I take a pencil and I draw a pencil mark all over my workpiece. I sand with 120 grit. When all the pencil's gone, I know I'm good. Then I scribble all over it again with pencil. And then I sand with 180 grit. When all the pencil's gone, I know I'm good. Then I stop there. Bonus tip, invest in a good sander. It doesn't have to be an expensive festival sander. Just get a good sander. It's not one of those tools you want to cheap out on. If you had a list of all your important tools, these are the ones I want to spend money on. These are the ones I don't really care about. Sander, put it high on the list. Reason being, every project you do, you're going to have to sand it. If you sand with a crappy sander, you're going to hate sanding. You're going to be all jittery. The thing's all the thing's shaking like crazy and it's like chattering your teeth out as it's trying to sand because it's a really crappy sander and then you hate it and your teeth hurt get a good sander second lesson learned double-sided tape man i love double-sided tape i use this stuff all the time like it it's insane how often i use double-sided tape and i really wish i would have known this a long time ago you make a routing template double-sided tape you need to hold a workpiece down while you're doing something double-sided tape Double-sided tape makes the world go round. Some people will opt for blue tape and CA glue. Same principle, same thing. It's just this takes more work and it can be a little bit messier and you got more steps to do compared to double-sided tape, which does the exact same thing. I don't care which one you do. I'm just saying that I really wish I would have known the tricks on how to do this stuff when I first started woodworking. I'll even use double-sided tape whenever I'm cutting metal. So if I'm cutting brass or aluminum at my table saw, I'll take the metal, take some double-sided tape and stick it onto something else like hardboard. And then that way I don't have metal sliding around on my cast iron tabletop. I feel like I have a little bit more control and then I make my cuts that way and I get really clean cuts. Lesson number three, I really wish I would've known I didn't have to measure everything. Actually, a lot of times our measurements don't even matter whatsoever. When I first started woodworking, I thought you had to measure everything. So if I was making a box, I would measure my boards to make sure that I had the right size box. That's understandable. But then if I had to put compartments inside that box, I would then measure those pieces to make sure they fit. That's what I'm talking about. That's not necessary. Instead, we could use relative dimensioning as in all we have to do is cut a piece until it fits into place. It might take a couple cuts to get the exact fit, but as far as the exact measurements on the inside, it doesn't matter whatsoever as long as the piece fits. Probably the most common situation that you'll see me do this is whenever I'm making boxes because I make a lot of boxes. And what you'll see is whenever I'm fitting the box bottom into place, I'll take my combination square, I'll put it into the groove of my box and I'll set it. And then I move it out and I'll place marks all around the perimeter of the bottom of my box. And then I'll cut the box bottom so it fits inside those marks. I have no idea how deep that groove is. And I also have no idea the length and width of my panel that's gonna be the box bottom. My fourth lesson learned is milling extra material. I really wish I would have done this whenever I first started woodworking. And I think I didn't because I treated wood so preciously. Like I don't have the extra wood to mill up. So I'm just gonna mill the stuff I need for this project. Well, then ultimately what happened is I would make cuts. Those cuts would be wrong off for some reason. My piece didn't go together. And then I wasted all the material for my project. It ended up wasting more material and more time and more money than if I would have just milled some extra boards up. The two most common reasons why I will mill extra material is one, to make up for mistakes. We're all gonna make mistakes in the shop. And sometimes everything looks great, you do something, something happens. I don't know, you sneeze while you're cutting. I don't know, whatever. And then that workpiece is screwed up and you got to replace it. The second reason why I will mill up extra material is for test cutting, especially whenever I'm doing angles. 
If I'm gonna cut miters, I wanna make sure that that saw blade is exactly at the angle that I want or my miter gauge is at the right angle. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll take those extra pieces, I'll make sure that I cut those 45 degrees, take them, measure them, put a square up to it, make sure that they're exactly the way that I want them before I cut my actual work piece. My next lesson learned is not using my bandsaw to resaw all the time. Whenever I started woodworking, I thought, well, I need to get a bandsaw that I can do a lot of resawing on because, well, that's what you see. Go watch YouTube videos. People use the bandsaw and it's an amazing tool for it. I totally get it. What I find though is that I actually like to use my table saw to do that more often. And what I really don't like is changing out my bandsaw blade. Yes, I can absolutely resaw my bandsaw and do a great job at it. The thing is, is that whenever I resaw it, I want to have a wider blade, like a three quarter inch blade. But I only use a blade that big when I'm resawing. All the other times I want a thinner blade. So I usually keep like a quarter inch blade in my saw. Instead, what I do is I go over to the table saw. I will resaw my board down and typically I'll leave just a thin little slice of material right in the middle. And I can come back over to my bandsaw and then cut the remaining out on a saw blade that is really small like this one right here. Yeah, I know that using the table saw could have a bigger kerf. You would lose a little bit more material. But what I find is that it is a million times faster. I get really good cuts, really good results, and I don't have to spend all that time changing out bandsaw blades. The sixth lesson learned for me is don't over glue. Hey, if you wanna take it and you wanna drench glue all over your project, go for it. The thing is, is it's a real big pain to try to clean up and it increases the risk of making a finishing mistake. You really don't need that much glue. One thing I noticed when I first started woodworking is how many people really cherished that glue squeeze out. So they would show that they're making something and then they clamp it together and they see all that glue squeeze out and they go, ooh, that's a really good squeeze out right there. And I thought, oh, well, that's what you need then. You need to have all that squeeze out. I've seen squeeze out a whole lot. Do you know what you do with all of that extra squeeze out? You then have to clean it all up. All that squeeze out didn't make a stronger joint because that squeeze out, it's no longer in the joint. It's all over the place. So now you are stuck trying to clean all of that up with a chisel or water or sanding or all of it. The seventh thing that I really wish I would have known when I first started woodworking is reevaluating how I deal with clamps. Do not necessarily invest in really expensive clamps if I didn't need those really expensive clamps. A lot of times a cheaper clamp will do just fine. You don't have to have the most expensive parallel clamp out there to do something small like a box. Alternatively, I wish I would have known to spend money on the specialty clamps that do an exceptional job at what they do, such as a corner clamp, something like this. This is a fantastic clamp. It is perfect for doing picture frames or boxes. It really wasn't that expensive, but I held off on buying stuff like this because I figured, well, I need all these other clamps instead, and I need to spend all this money on clamps for all these other projects. How often will I use this compared to using these parallel clamps and these other things? And what I find is that a lot of those sit on my shelf and I don't use them as often, and I do use something like this. Okay, real talk. Next lesson learned. Tool reviews are usually biased. Tools can be really expensive. So whenever I first started woodworking, I needed to buy a new tool, I would do some research and see if I can find multiple people talking about the tool, good or bad reviews. What I didn't know was exactly the nature of the relationships between content creators and tool manufacturers. It's something that might be more publicly known now, but when I first started woodworking, it wasn't really clear. It doesn't mean that a lot of the tool reviews out there are purposely misleading, though some could be. A lot of times it's more that it's really easy to become biased in that review and you're not really getting an accurate representation of the tool and its capabilities. Let's say that company A makes a drill, they send it to you, you use that drill, that drill drills things just nice well, then you wanna give a glowing review by it because, well, you got the drill for free, the company was really nice, you don't wanna be rude to them, and it drilled just fine. Now, that's all okay. At the same time though, does that review get into the point of being 
overly glowy? Is it becoming more of a sales pitch that you have to buy this drill? That's what I'm talking about of that bias kind of seeping in there. And it's something that I wasn't really aware of until, well, I started doing woodworking for a while. Another thing that I just didn't know about was the affiliate programs that are out there. So if you really look at a lot of content creators, myself included, if you go down to our video description, you're gonna see links to products. And when you click on those links, content creators, again, like myself, get a little bit of a kickback. It's just a couple pennies here or there, but you know, those pennies all add up and you're not gonna click that link unless it's something that is clickable. Well, what's gonna be clickable? Me saying, hey, this product's terrible, stay away from it. Or me saying, this tool is amazing, you definitely need to have it in your life. Oh, well, at least let me check it out. Click, all right. Well, you clicked it, you put it in your shopping cart, you bought it, I get a kickback from that. There's a lot of great people out there giving great, honest reviews, so you don't have to be skeptical. Just maybe ask yourself questions about why that person is giving that review and can you spot any bias in the review itself? My ninth lesson learned for old self is using templates, as in taking something, drawing a shape, whatever you need, taking that, spray gluing that onto a piece of material and then using that to cut out your pieces. That is something that I never even considered when I first started woodworking. So I would take a pencil and draw what I wanted. And that's perfectly fine except whenever that drawing is not as perfect as what I wanted it. Now, if you watch my channel, you'll see it's kind of what I do. I do it on a ton of projects. It's fantastic. I really wish that I would have known to do that before. And then also, it's really easy to clean up. You take some mineral spirits and you rub mineral spirits on that template and it will peel right up without any sort of issues. My 10th lesson learned is picking the sharpening method that you hate the least. Yes, the one that you don't hate. A sharp tool will change your life. Use a dull chisel and then use a sharp chisel. You'll notice the difference. The other day I had to remove some material from a picture frame that I made, which was about one inch thick. It was a lot of material to remove, but a sharp chisel made that process really easy. But you're never gonna get a sharp chisel if you don't want to sharpen your tools. So one thing that I tried to do whenever I was first started woodworking was using the sharpening method that I saw other people using. And I thought, well, if they're using it, that has to be the way to do it. So what I ended up doing was getting a lot of water stones or wet stones. And these are a fantastic method for sharpening. The thing that I did not like about it was soaking my stones. It was messy. Water was all over the place. It ended up becoming a process where I had to set aside time and say, right now is going to be my sharpening time. Let me get all my tools out. Let me sharpen everything right now because I don't want to get these messy guys out any other time. And then I would turn around and use my tools. And if my tools got dull, I would end up dealing with the dull blade instead of getting all the stuff back out again. These days I have a much simpler process. I use diamond stones, I use a straw. Diamond stones, really simple. I spray a little bit of water on it, sharpen my chisel, I'm good to go. I don't have to worry about flattening it like I do with a wet stone. So I end up using these more often, but then also I got a strop because a lot of times I don't need to redo an entire edge of a chisel. I don't need, I don't need to make it a production. I can take my strop and do a couple strokes of that chisel on that strop and I am back in business. So doing this has made it where I want to have a sharp tool instead of dealing with a dull tool because I simply don't want to go through this process. I'm not advocating for diamond stones over wet stones or wet stones over stropping or crazy sharp method or whatever else. What I'm saying is find the method that you don't dislike and go with that one instead of doing the method that everyone else is telling you to do. Because really, it doesn't matter how you sharpen your tool as long as it's sharp. So there you have it, 10 things that I really wish I would have known when I first started woodworking. If you have some other lessons learned that you experienced, leave me a comment down below. I would love to read those and we can all kind of learn together. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, consider watching this other video because, well, I thought it was pretty good too. Until we meet again, get in your shop and build something awesome.